everyone. My name is Rebecca Edwards and I'm the curator at Arbeit Gallery in London. If this is your first time with us, Arbeit Gallery is a gallery that commissions artists working at the intersection of digital practice, new technologies and critical thinking. Um, and we've been working in this way since 2013. Um, Arbeit Skills is something that we launched in 2020 and Arbeit Skills are introductions to creative software and short courses on digital theory led by artists and curators working within the digital realm. So far, we've done workshops on coding, 3D designing, sound editing, as well as cross-platform game engines and virtual world making. And um, these creative courses were really made to fill a gap we saw for short but in-depth peer-to-peer learning something in between a YouTube tutorial and a university short course, all via a supportive network of like-minded people. Um, the classes are always small, which gives participants a chance to receive a more personal and hands-on approach in a more friendly and encouraging environment. Um, and the main aim of the workshops is for participants to leave with skills that they can apply in their creative development. So today, giving the first of three workshops we've programmed in collaboration with the Serpentine and their second issue of Future Art Ecosystems is Danielle Brathwaite Shirley. Um, Danielle is an artist working predominantly in animation, sound, performance and video games to communicate the experiences of, black trans, of a black trans person. Their practice focuses on recording the lives of black trans people and intertwining lived experience with fiction to imaginatively retell trans stories. Spurred on by a desire to record the history of, of trans people both living and past, their work can often be seen as a trans archive where black trans people are stored for the future. Um, and we're excited to be working on a new commission with Danielle that will open at Arbeit in November this year. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for that one. Um, but with me today is Eva from our collaborators at Serpentine, who will share a bit about future art ecosystems. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Katerina and Jess. So yeah, I am Ava Yeager and I'm associate curator at Serpentine uh, where I work on the, specifically on the R&D platform team. And our initiative is basically to operationalize the research that we do and also generally artistic research within the art field. And as part of that, we produce an annual strategic briefing called Future Art Ecosystems. And the idea behind that work is to provide concepts, references, language, and arguments that can be integrated into operational agendas for 21st century cultural infrastructure. So the idea is that what you find in that report is something that you can utilize also in the different projects that you're doing, whether you work internally as an art worker at an institution or within your own art practice. Um, on July 6th, the team along with a lot of amazing contributors, including Danielle, launched the second issue of Future Art Ecosystems, Art and Metaverse. And this time around, we focused on metaverse infrastructure that might interface with the art world. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with the term, um, it's an always online, persistent, spatial second world. And for us, it represents a kind of fundamental shift in our notion of digital systems and presence. And so it will require new skills in order to grasp its implications. Um, I'll drop a link uh, in the chat so that you can read the report and sort of um, find out more about what we're doing. But as part of this exploration into virtual experiences, we really wanted to bring you a series of technical workshops that were focused on art making in the metaverse. Um, so we thought who better to kick us off than Danielle, someone who we've been really inspired by and who's contributed in many ways um, to future art ecosystems, including our latest podcast, Playtesting uh, Counter Archives. So we're really looking forward to today and also to working with Arbeit and Danielle in the future. Um, so yeah, over to you, Danielle. Hi, everyone. Okay, so um, if you don't want your videos on, can you unmute yourself um, so that we can hear you? Um, because our first thing that we're going to do, which is going to be a little icebreaker, is create a little AI journey together. So the first thing we need to do is decide what our setting is. What should the setting be? You can just shout it out if you want. 
Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk, there we go. Okay, and now we have to select a character. So cyborg, punk, cop, or android? Cyborg. <laughs> cyborg. Perfect. Okay, and so um, I'm gonna mix the name between both of you. So I'm gonna call them Katarina uh, Jess. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so this is like an AI generated um, story. So anything that you say to it, it can react to. And I thought this was a good way of um, introducing each other um, as well as telling a story at the same time. So I'll be the like orator, so I'll read it for us. Um, but I will then pass it on to you to then come up for the next bit of the story. So you are Katerina Jess, a cyborg living in the futuristic city of Zale. You have a bionic arm and a hollow band. You're walking down a dark city streets while neon lights flash brightly above you. As you pass an alley, you see two men injecting some, something into the door of a shuttered shop. You are about to call out when you feel a whack in the back. You stagger forward a bit before turning around. So what I want you to do is to come up with the next bit of the story, which we will feed into the AI, but also have it as a part of an introduction of yourself. Um, so this could be um, a Katerina, Katerina walks to the left um, while working at the job X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. So Katerina leaves, uh, uh, leaves Goldsmiths to walk, uh, to 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 have into the supermarket to buy food for her new kitten. Oh. It's called uh, 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 called uh, Luna. You, Katerina, leaves Goldsmith to head into a supermarket to buy food for her new kitten called Luna. You walk into the supermarket and find yourself face to face with a large group of people, all yelling and pushing each other. Looking around you, you realize what's happening. It's a food riot. Now, Jess, <laughs> if you'd like to do the same. Okay. Um, so, as an artist, <laughs> Uh, you create some food for the riot. Uh, you as an artist, you create some food for the riot. You sit down on a marble bench and conjure up <laughs> waste bucket foam hands to hold a paintbrush. Uh, you begin to paint a picture of a beautiful girl holding an apple on the side of the building. Do I introduce myself as this AI kind of situation? No, no, no. You can you can say whatever you want, and it will be able to respond. Whatever you want. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. So, hi everyone. I'm Uli. I'm Maris. I work with interactive installations and performances. So I mess around a lot with science and technology. And I was interested in what kind of interaction is going to happen there because I've done a couple of interactive performances um, with Columbia University and I just want to see what you're cooking here and take part in it and like share and exchange and help you with anything if needed. I'm trying to write some of that. <laughs> the oh, you, can just, you, can just, you can just type that I'm like artist who works with interactive installation. I think it's fine. Oh, I was going to say, relation. You say, hi, everyone. Um, you are Uli. You're an artist. You have done a couple of interactive performances at Columbia University. You work with interactive installation. Uh, a pretty blonde woman walks over and watches you painting. Hi, I'm Uli, you say, introducing yourself. Pretty good, she says, but you need to work on your posture. <laughs> Is it is it like what is it like AI gives a response to the phrase that I'm entering? So what the AI does is takes in all the words uh -huh. and it um, 
uses the entire internet to generate a response to to whatever you're writing into it. Nice one. Um, and I think maybe we can do um, Rebecca and Eva, just so because Yuli was late, so you can do a little introduction and then I'll type it in and we can keep it going. Rebecca, you go first. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm curator at Arbyte. Um, and I, I like apples. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. You say, hi, you are uh, Rebecca. You are a curator at Arabite and you like apples. Rebecca smiles and offer you, offers you a slice of an apple, which you happily take. Thanks, you say. I'm glad someone likes apples. Rebecca looks around and frowns. Eva, <laughs> your turn. Because Ava took all of the apples from the a slice of apples. Ava took all the slices of apple. Um, it's so typical of her. Um, and she just walked walked away with her little dog, who has. One, uh, her name, her little dog, whose name is Neo, but also has an alter ego named Daniel. Meow or Mio? Neo, N-E-O. That's a great name for a dog, Eva. <laughs> Unfortunately, Daniel's with us more often than Neo is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, uh, because Ava took all the apples, uh, all the slices of apples, it's so typical of her, and she just walked away with her dog, whose name is Neo, who has an alter ego called Daniel. She managed to snag herself a slice, you say. Thanks, Liz. I'm still a little hungry. Rebecca takes a bite of the apple and shakes her head. I don't know why you don't like this apple. <laughs> I'm gonna, so I'm going to say... Uh, Danielle enters the room and says, welcome to all of you to this workshop. I hope there will be enough apples for all of you and that you can take a slice of something from this space. Okay. So you, Danielle, enters the room, welcome you all to the workshop, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Danny, or nickname, walks into the room carrying a paper bag of apples. Sorry I'm late, she says, I've got apples for everyone, but you're still going to eat. Right. <laughs> so that's just a small introduction. Um, just hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, so short run through of the day. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at like a couple of games. And I'm going to ask you to... Um, to note down some things that you think about when you're looking at the games. Um, so for example, things you like, things you don't like, um, things that grabbed you, um, what you noticed. I I'll just ask a bunch of questions as you're looking at them, don't worry. Um, and then from that point on, we're gonna start thinking about designing our own kind of interactive experience and what the point of that experience would be. Um, so for example, um, if the point is to make the viewers scared, we would try and think about how we could do that use like in terms of controller, interactivity, investment of the, the person investing their own self. So you can like use that to scare them, things like that. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is I'm going to post the link. It might already be in the chat. What you're gonna do is click on that link um, and it will take you to a place thing called gather. Um, so you can put your name in and press enter. Um, I will do it, actually. I will share my screen and do it with you. So it should take you to a screen like this. Um, you can put your name in and uh, don't worry about camera or microphone because we're using the Zoom camera and microphone. So don't, you don't need to worry about that. Just press the join gather. Um, and it should take you to a space like this. If you're in an island, um, that's just the tutorial to help you walk about and you can skip it on the left hand side 
um, there's a skip button. So you can press skip. Um, and so here are, um, I've like collated like a bunch of games and inter interactive websites, which we're gonna look at. Um, and I'm gonna give you maybe 10, 15 minutes to look at them. Um, and all I want you to do is note down things that you like and dislike from these uh, sites. So simple things like you don't like the user face, it took too long to load, um, just things like that. Um, you like the control method, you like the graphics, all that kind of stuff. Um, just link those. If anyone has any problem also accessing this, just post, uh, just message me or say something um, and we'll sort that out for you. So as, as you're noting things down, I'm just going to go through one and talk because uh, it's too hard to just stay silent on this for me. Um, <laughs> it's just way too hard. But please feel free to ignore everything I am saying. Which one should I go through? Do you want, I'll, I'll go through my own because it feels, it feels best to do it. And talk about the things I don't like. Yeah, why not? I've muted it, so you won't be able to hear it. So apologies for that. Okay. So my one uh, is the one called Under the Surface. Uh, it's the one where you uh, use a ship to navigate around. Um, and I made this when I was thinking about um, history, essentially like uh, how the sea is an ever-changing um, landmass, if we think of it as a landmass, which has no ability to hold history on its surface. Um, every event that happens on it sinks. Um, and so if you try and chart a history of the sea, it's very hard to understand when hap what happened. Um, if you find a relic, it's very hard to figure out what exactly happened to make that relic um, appear at the bottom of the sea. Um, but I also wanted to talk about how some of that a kind of erasure is happening now, you know, and actively happening now um, and caused by uh, ourselves, but also like the governments and um, how, how the sea can kind of hide things that are essentially not wanting to be talked about. Um, so the first thing you have to do is name your ship. So I'll call my ship the workshop, obviously, after you lot, in, in dedication to you lot. So the workshop. So all you do is sail around and it takes you to like random places and different things happen. It's much better with sound, but there's no sound here. Um, and so here it says, did the gape in less cause a scar? It says, don't trust the words of the ocean. It says, look at your reflection in the water. Can the water hold your reflection above the sea or do you think it will be buried below the waves? Here's like an image of someone. <laughs> Very cryptic I am, but these all mean things to me, but I don't, I'm not gonna tell you. Um, it hides all bodies who fall in. All bodies carried across it. The workshop, which is the, you know, what are you doing here? Um, so this character asks, what are you doing? Uh, I am trying to, history, um, I'm trying to find out my history. Um, and they say, do they know they can help us? I'm not so sure in relation to me. Do you know who this is? And there's no one here. Do you know how your ancestors used the sea? Which is a good question. Um, because I don't think a lot of us do know exactly how our ancestors used the sea. Um, uh, at the time I was looking at a lot of, you have three minutes left by the way, to make notes. <laughs> Multitasking is something you have to do. <laughs> um, so um, I was looking at the history of piracy when I was making this. And piracy was actually used by the government in the UK as a kind of like a, a, a spy system. So if they wanted to do something in a country um, far away, but didn't want it to link back to them, they would um, send their gentlemen as pirates. Um, and so any atrocities that happened would not be linked to the um, UK government. 
Uh, so do you know how they traveled across its surface? Um, like I don't. Ooh. The ship which is has no cargo, and I'm sure like you can infer what that kind of means. Um, there is a wound left in the sea. You may have left it there. It was used to navigate the ocean and its blood is still spilling across its waves. The wound cannot be closed. We are part of this wound. We are lost in this wound. It's so weird with no sound, but anyway. Um, the wound is too deep to understand. So these wounds are kind of like gaps in history. Um, and so for me, I think of them as like, um, do you know an earth when the pressure uh, pushes down, um, basically makes fossils. So when you cut down through the earth, you can see all the segmented layers of history and kind of infer uh, time and generations of that. The wounds are kind of like that. So for me, you would go in and you'd be able to see segmented bits of history of like when someone was buried, when someone was taken across the sea, what they did on the sea, how they fished, how they got their food, um, how they navigated it. Because um, there's all these stories about like different kinds of navigations, like using the stars, different star maps, different star charts, different boats and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of it we don't know much about. One minute left, everyone. <laughs> Remember the year this all started? I wonder what, you, what year you will come to your mind. Um, have you buried your own memories? Have you buried someone else's? There's a bunch of little ships around a little hole. Uh, these are some relics. Um, these relics, some of them are in Brit I think maybe all of them are in the British Museum actually. Can't remember now. Um, but the essentially, um, at the time I was looking at uh, relics that taken across the seas and basically stolen um, and how some of them have were, the ships that were carrying them were actually, you know, destroyed. And so these relics now exist underneath the sea with like a, a loss of origin and a loss of purpose. And that's time. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, that's enough for me, great. So if we gather back, um, the next task we're going to do is that we're going to start thinking of designing our own. I'm not just going to chuck you in there, though. Don't worry. Uh, we're not just going to start doing that. Um, but so the first thing I want you to do is I'm going to give you two minutes. And it's a very short time, but don't worry. I'm going to give you longer in a sec. But two minutes just to write down 20 things that you're passionate about that don't have to do with anything I've just talked about just 20 things that you have passion about. Okay, and then the next thing I want you to do, these are quick fire, don't worry, this is just to get your brain start working. Um, the next thing I want you to do is write down who your community is and five things that make them your community. Now your community can be anything from League of Legends gameplay people to people that help you put your sofa on in your room. But label who you think your community is and five things that make them that community. And the last thing I want you to do is write down one message that you strongly stand by something that you really, really, really strongly stand by. So those will be the foundation of the rest of the workshop. Um, and so I, the next thing I want us to do is I want you to begin to think of creating a game for that particular community that you all mentioned. So those group of people, you're gonna make something, we're gonna think of making something, designing something for them. And so I've, I've put a um, link in the chat. So if you click on the link, it should bring something up like this. It actually brought a window before that said new diagram or load diagram. Um, press on new diagram um, and go to blank diagram and press create. And it will save it on your computer like a file. So I'll name it. This is mine. Please ignore my naming system. It's terrible on my computer. And so all this will take you to is a, a document like this. And we're going to make a flowchart, essentially, to like plan out 
um, this game that we would make together. Um, and so the first thing I want you to do is on the left hand side, there's this box, um, this little, just like the square. I want you to drag, click and drag it in and put it in the middle. Um, and so essentially what this box lets you do is like type in it. Um, and the first thing I want you to think about is what's the first thing that needs to be made clear to your audience? Your audience is your community. What's the first thing you want to make clear to them? In terms of interaction with the, or like, or like, like what? Well, that's kind of up to you, but, um, so for me, as an example, I, the first thing I'd make, want to make clear before any interaction can even take place, I would say this is a, a black trans space in the black trans game for black trans people. That's, that's what I would do because that's kind of my passion. Um, but it's the, it's the thing that hits them maybe before they touch anything. So it's kind of, if you think of it in terms of a movie, it's like the movie trailers get the theme across before you actually get to experience the story. And this is the same thing. It's like the, 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 the feel you want to get across to, what, to the community, the people that you care about. The first thing you want to get across. And so um, the next thing I wanted us to do, and I'm gonna reshare my screen is, so everyone kind of told us like, oh, I want to, people said like, oh, I wanna make my game like accessible to everyone, open to everyone. I want my game to be uh, specific. I think uh, he was said to those who tried or, or those who were willing to try or something like this. I can't quite remember. Um, but now I want us to think about how we do that. How do we make sure that the audience members knows that? How do you convey that? Like how, how is that message conveyed before you get to the controller? And this is more of like a, I guess we can like have a little discussion here. Everyone's like, oh. <laughs> do you mean how, before the game starts, they know that the space is built up for a specific group. Yeah, so you said that you wanted people to know that, that it was open for everyone, mm -hmm. for anyone. So how would you let them know that? Like, would it be simply like a text for you? Would it be, uh, it's, would you think of like, oh, I would like install it on the walls. If it's a web-based thing, would you say, oh no, it would just be like something very simple, straightforward. Like, how would you let the audience know do I have a condition where this game runs? Is it online or is it in a physical space? Uh, it's it's a whatever you want. Like this is it, this is completely imaginary. So it can be your wildest dream. Um, what what feels right for you? Okay, I think for me, my first thought is um, visuals. I mean, again, this is kind of assuming that um, the game is going to be visual and people participating um, can see. But for me, visuals are probably the first thing that I think about when I think about um, my community understanding that it's for them or wanting to engage with whatever it may be. So whether it's, um, you know, seeing themselves in the visuals or um, a style or a color palette that I know is appealing um, that for me is quite indicative. And mm. um, what, what was your, your uh, message or the first thing you wanted them to know? Oh, um, for me, it was that um, art is for everyone and it's whatever makes you feel. So my 
poorly defined community is people who are interested in the arts who are not in the art world. Mm. My question to you would be like, how would you use images to say that? What would your image be? Um, I would collage images um, of art, Um, but, you know, I wouldn't have like a Mona Lisa and a Rodan, which is, I'm thinking about museums and, you know, uh, bringing people who may not feel comfortable in museums closer to art. Um, And so the images of art that I would use um, would be by artists who work with found objects or um, artists who focus their subjects on their communities and sharing their stories. So something that typically is not seen in museums, um, but actually is very emotive and very engaging. Um, and it's kind of art by the people for the people. And um, where would this image be in relation to the work? Would, like, would it be like a splash screen? Would it be next to the, this game, this imaginary game? Would it be like, how, where would this be? Yeah, I think it depends on what, because I, I don't know yet what the game is. Like, I don't know if it's a real life thing or if it's a computer thing. So if it's a, you know, like a PlayStation game, that would be the cover. If it is a physical a kind of bodily game it would be an image on the entrance if it's uh, on a website that would be the landing page so the first image the first encounter Brilliant. thank you thank you i think so now i would like you to think about um what kind of game you would make so a lot of the questions you've already been answering are asking me and like asking yourself like this is the moment where you get to kind of answer them um and so in terms of what kind of game, what kind of like genre of game it is, how people interact with it, and where where you will find it. For example, Yuli talked about um, having like an online version and an offline version, um, each like kind of displaying it. It's the same things in different ways. Um, but now we're talking about like the, the game itself, the interactive thing itself, like what is it doing? So like, what's the story it's telling? Um, how people interact with it and what kind of genre is it Um, but I'm going to give you maybe 10 minutes to really come up with like a real good like basis of a story Um, and the kind of like control methods and where you want to put it when you say control methods what do you mean Um, so I mean um, is it uh, access via like a keyboard and mouse or do you use mm. a dance mat to play it or do you use like a um, if you put on a coat to play it um, mm-hmm. is it like webcam based it, does it just use the body of the person the face the skin color the tone of the hair um, things like that like the how people interact with your game because it doesn't yeah. have to be just like a, a an Xbox 360 controller it can be something quite different, you know, it can be whatever you want. Hello. <laughs> so just to also get you thinking about controllers, I'm just going to show you some while you think about that. So here is a little um, modern day SNES controller. So this view would just play like, there's like arcade buttons and these things kind of light up. They're really nice to press, make really nice sounds. Good old fashioned motion controls, like a Wii. It's a bit dusty, apologies for that, but this is really fun. Or I've got to turn my background off for this one though. My my recent obsession. Oh, this is so cool. What is this? This is a dance mat. Ah, you stay on, on the top of it. Yeah, so like you put it on the floor and you stand on it. Is it inflatable? No, no, no. It just sounds like that. 
but then what it does for you does it feel soft or like does it rotate you mm, no it feels soft but, but what you do is um it's got arrow keys on it so say if you wanted to move your character to left you could yeah. step here and your character would move to the left that is so amazing um and, i love this and i mean these are really cool because you could just plug them into your computer and make them do it, whatever you want your computer i mean you could even type with it but don't do that um but yeah, just like letting you think about different kind of controllers as such. I think I have a couple more. Where did you get that? Is it like, is it just, you can just buy it anyway? Yeah, like uh, it's on um, Amazon actually. Um, and the great thing about these is that like, just because it's, it's fabric, you can customize them really easily. So you could like uh, stitch on your own design. Mm -hmm. um, it's also really nice to be able to interact in a more bodily way. Exactly. rather than just being very stiff and like still exactly it makes you feel much more um, yeah it's not like it's, it's something i love about those kind of games is that like you feel like your actions mean something you know like when you, the way you move your body means something because usually when you're playing a game on the computer you're doing this but you can just lounge on the sofa yeah exactly um, but like say if um the game says um oh, you need to jump and and say stop to freeze to hide from the mysterious people. Like, yeah. people like oh, I need to freeze, but you can do really interesting things with that because then you can make people get in positions and then make them think about the implications of those positions that they're in. Yeah. Um, and so like you can start like using simple control methods to really like push forward your idea of what you, like, what you want. Um, like, yeah. That's so cool. So you got five more minutes. Um, and I can show you a sneak peek of my, this is the controller I've recently built um, for this anti-violence light gun game. <laughs> um, can you press it physically with the controller? Yeah, yeah, we physically made this. I don't have the, I got the images on my phone, maybe I can show you. Um, that's so cool. <laughs> And so like that's to make us so basically what the aim of this game is is the game is to make you excited to pick up the gun uh -huh. um, and then as soon as your that excitement hits you we like tell you how bad that excitement is and how bad it is to feel excited about picking up a gun for a game um because usually guns are so easy to like a lot of games have guns in them you know and it's so easy to shoot someone in the game because you don't think about it um and it feels so good to shoot someone in the game because there's been so many implementation of the same mechanic. Um, and so that's why we've made the gun that's uncomfortable to hold, makes you excited to hold it, and then insults you and makes you terrified of pulling the trigger at any moment. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of like how, how I uh, think of this way. So this is the, also this is the example of the game and this is it in action. Um, I call this creatures, is it like, like devils from hell? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's launching in, September, October, November, as part of Airbyte. Um, yeah, so you'll see it, you'll see it. And so our last activity of the day, the very last one before I leave you to begin your own game studios, <laughs> is I want you to imagine and, and, and flowchart out, but um, if, if you want to in the program that I showed you, um, which is, is this one, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, I want you to imagine one audience member playing through the game. And of course, you won't have all the interactions, you won't have all the things that happen. Um, but like, they begin the game. The, the first thing to start the game is, do they tap the screen? You know, do they, uh, you know, shove their friend next to them, which is amazing, starts the game. Do they step on the dance mat? And then... Um, what's the first choice that they have to make within the game? So, for example, I think Kaneva mentioned like creating a character, like that's the first choice. Um, you would usually, it could, your first choice could be um, testing out the emotions, you know, like, oh, smile, sad, or, or how are you feeling today, or whatever. Like, we're reading this, is this correct? Or whatever. Collabor uh, it could be a, what's it called? Calibration. Um, um, Will you, um, uh, Jess, it could be, 
um, tapping the screen to start and putting a name in. It could be um, choosing one of the people to learn from. Uh, the, I think you mentioned having those people who were archived and so it could be choosing one of them to start with. But uh, yeah, it could be uh, stepping on the dance mat um, and like slowly getting you used to stepping because it's that that not a usual thing to do. Um, so yeah, and I, I kind of want you to chart out the big, like one person's journey from beginning to end of a session. And I'm just gonna show you how I kind of do this so you can get an idea of it. Um, yes, please. And then you can do it. So what I would do is like, and I always create flowcharts, so I'd be like, right, so, um, person enters gallery um, and uh, to start the game, they have to uh, pick up controller and uh, pull trigger. And so that's the first thing they would have to do to even start the game. And I'm like, right, so what happens after they pull the trigger? And so what I will do is I'll drag another box here Bam. and I will connect it here. So when you, when you just hover underneath, you get these arrows. And if you click and hold and pull down, you can connect these boxes. So kind of making a little flow chart. And so here you would type, okay, so what happens when the trigger is pulled? Oh, game starts loud sounds and introduction uh, to level selection, right? And say, so, okay, great. So this introduction to level selection, how many levels are there? Let's say there's three levels. Right. Um, so now there's three choices to make, level one, level two, level three. So great. So now we have to make three of those, level one, level two, level three. And so with, with you, Yuli, it might be, um, oh, there's six emotions, sad, happy, God, I can't list them, um, upset, anxious, whatever. Um, and so you would start splitting those out. And so, okay, so level one, what happens when we click level one? Um, level one is a water level, which tests your reaction speeds, let's say. And say, right, so it tests your reaction speed. So we're doing slow to fast. So if you're too slow, what happens? If you're, too, if you're very fast, what happens? Um, like, oh, and maybe here it's like, oh, if I'm too slow, you fail and get kicked out of the game. So too slow, fail. And then if you're fast, fast, you succeed and get to select another level. So like something as simple as this, basically, like it doesn't have to be way too in depth or anything, um, but just kind of charting out what choices are available and what happens when those choices get made. Does that kind of make some sense? Okay, cool. Um, ask me anytime, anything, um, don't worry. Uh, it doesn't, and you don't have to do it like this, it doesn't have to look as like this, um, but this is just kind of how I usually map them out. Um, but something I also find helpful is I also map out interactions with physical spaces like this as well. So I do like, right, someone enters the gallery, what's the first thing they see? Um, if they look on the left wall, what do they see? If they look on the right wall, what do they see? Um, if they watch the video, how do they feel? Um, if they don't watch the video, how might they feel? Um, so I also map out like actual physical interactions like this just for my head. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me rambling enough. And as you're doing that, I'm just gonna quickly just show you some examples of these that I've made. Um, you don't have to look at these just in case that you wanted uh, to see an example of one. Um, but this is an example of one of my new works I've made. Um, and you can see the flowchart is actually kind of a bit wild, but not too wild. But basically it has like, um, you know, I kind of put like, right, so the GIF in text is the thing that like explains who it's for. Then there's a splash screen, which um, is looped until you press a button. So it's like what everyone can leave on. Um, and then this is a video based game. So like it, you have to, uh, it's just a, it plays a video depending on what your choices are. Um, and so 
um, I put like, okay, so there's the first choice, what the text is of the first choice and what happens if you choose each of the first choices. So the first choice is here are who are your ancestors and their options are colonizer and those that were carried across the sea. Um, and then it's you see it's kind of like splits out into like different experiences of who's picking what and what's happening. And some videos are the same, but some videos are not. Um, this is a different diagram. Wow. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, which is kind of a, I made this interview game where you could interview different people. And so these are people that you could interview. Um, and it was quite a simple one, um, but uh, you would get different answers based on uh, what question you would ask them. And I, I ended, this didn't end up getting made like this, but this was like my initial idea. And if this loads, right. Um, and this was my initial one for that ship game I just talked about. Um, this was my initial um, kind of mind map slash uh, flow chart. So um, when I'm trying to plan things out, I, I use flow charts just because it makes sense in my head, um, but often like they change a lot and I use them more as like a mind map for like uh, themes, um, what I want in there, what I don't want in there, what I'm trying to figure out how to put in there just to get everything kind of out and down um, so that then later on, often, oftentimes later on things I just want in there become choices much, much later on to the project um, because I've, you've made the foundation to, to do that. Um, but yeah, so this is just my, this is kind of the aesthetic that I was going for over here. Um, and then these were my initial renders of the aesthetic um, and kind of like the horror themes I wanted, blah, 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 blah. The kind of glitch themes I wanted here um, and the very, very loose, like, right, so there's a ship encounter, what happens? I just kind of want this theme to be here. Um, you know, there's a there's a glitch world where I want it to look like this, etc. Blah blah blah. So those are kind of like why I love flowcharts. <laughs> um, but that's it, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, but I really appreciate everyone coming, and I hope that you can take something away from them. Yeah, thank you so much. Just like thank you so much. Um, there's a little bunch of stuff coming out soon, so. Um, I will send it around to you, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, and have a lovely, lovely day. And that's it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye.